Hello and welcome. On behalf of Interior Health, we would like to recognize and acknowledge the traditional territory of the Silk Nation where we live, learn, collaborate, and work together. The IH Research Week 2018. Uh, today's presentation is Patient Engagement and Research, and will be a panel presentation with Carl Maywald, Paul Bergener, Lauren Erth, sorry, Erth, and Kathy Rush. Thank you all for joining us today. And make it away, Karen. Thanks, Kim. Mm, just uh, opportunity today about patient engagement and research. There's a couple of people that will be presenting today. Very welcome to present today. Can, can you give an idea about how many people are in the room? Okay. Oh, good. Thank you. So this is just today an opportunity, very brief introduction to um, the strategy for patient-oriented research, but as well patient engagement, the work we have to do in interior health. My name is Karen Mywald. I completed my PhD some time ago, and I'm a happy staff member of Interior Health Research Department. And I'll be talking to you for the next slide. Okay. A little bit uh, very brief again, and uh, the resources are at the last slide. I'll tell you a little bit about the strategy for patient-oriented research. This was an initiative that started uh, via the Canadian Institute of Health Research. This program uh, for initiative was started in different provinces in this country. The last province to come on board was British Columbia, and the formation of the BC support unit um, was about 215 to 16, and it's hosted in Vancouver, and we call it the Vancouver Central Ready Hub. As a part of the BC support unit, uh, we have four uh, regional centers. Each North Health Authority is integrating or implementing the BC support initiative in the various health authorities. This is a partnership between the BC support unit and different health authorities. So what we have is a Fraser Centre, Interior Centre, Northern Centre, and Island. Interior Centre is expected to bring the opportunity for collaboration in research and research process, research-related activities as well as offer services and support and deliver training. Also increase the availability and the utility of data and related services to that for patient-oriented research. What is novel is in the Interior Center is that we started with a patient engagement and research committee. This committee was formed in September 2016 and start with the thought of have perhaps having fewer for our patient partners work with us to assist in the development and implementation of patient engagement infrastructure. However, the response was, uh, was very positive and somewhat overwhelming, but very exciting as well, because what we had way more people respond to the call to the recruitment advertisement. So we actually started with a somewhat bigger 35 people which was then identified by the committee itself that they would hope to go up to seven, eight patient partners. Next slide. So who's on this peer committee, as we call it? We have Paul Bergener, who will be presenting just after me, and who is from Nelson, and I happen to be as well based in Nelson. Uh, Marilyn Parker, who is now in Kelowna, but uh, has been living in Kamloops for some before that. Then Charlie Boy joined us, joined Williams Lake. Alison Coyman, Fernand, Sheldon Dyer, who lives and works in Cranbrook and lives in Kimberley. Darren Gregory, and I apologize, Darren, it's just a well, it's near Creston. And Michelle Hewitt from Kona. Uh, former patient partners um, are listed below, but what you can see is that this committee is formed from different people from the interior and from the interior region. They were all recruited to Patient Voice Network. However, the committee is open to membership of people who prefer not to be part of Patient Voice Network. Myself, I'm the co-chair of this committee, and our team is strengthened by Nelly Oki, who is the academic co-lead BC Support Unit Interior Center. Next slide. So very 
briefly and very quickly a tiny bit of an overview of what we've been up to since 2016. So one of the main activities in the first year of the work that we have been doing together is to develop, for example, a patient engagement and research plan. Part of that was to develop the, the terms of reference for this committee. And this committee has as well contributed to uh, research policies development, um, as well as provided input in the research refresh, which is the strategic plan update, which will be presented tomorrow by Dr. Yvonne Lefebvre and Dee Taylor at 11 o'clock. Um, as well, the peer has been uh, presenting at research department events, for example, the launch of the BC Support Unit Interior Centre, the Royal uh, Island uh, Hospital uh, research launch together with uh, Thompson University, presented at uh, guest lectures, uh, for example, nursing students and social work students, UBCO, Thompson River University, Selkirk College of the Rockies, Hopefully, in the future, we can also present uh, at other colleges in the interior region. We've also presented as a peer committee at provincial events, for example, the BC Support Unit Provincial Conference, which was held last year, October, and is coming, in, uh, coming up again in October of this year. Some of the uh, peer members are involved in provincial research projects, not only in British Columbia, for example, the BC Connections, Connections Project, but well, for example, uh, TRAC, which is a large cross uh, pan-Canadian study. So what we're doing more at present is we're still involved in these activities that I just mentioned, but as well participated in workshops that were delivered through Interior Health. What we're more focusing on right now is to engage the peer committees themselves so they can experience as well uh, this collaborative approach in research and full patient, patient engagement to be part of patient engagement research projects. Um, for example, we will be doing a study which is named the Environmental Scan for Patient Engagement Initiatives in Interior Health. Also, they will partake in the design and development of training and workshop, which is more focused on patient engagement and patient-oriented research to be delivered starting this fall. As well, the peer committee is involved in mentorship, for example, students, but as well researchers and healthcare decision makers and professionals who want to involve patient engagement elements in the research that they are doing. In the future, what we foresee is to continue the activities as we're doing them right now, but, and also is really planned to demonstrate true patient-oriented uh, peer research project. And one of the concerns that we try to address and want to address is to better implement findings of these collaborative projects. Next slide. So very briefly, what is patient-oriented research? Research that is conducted in partnerships with and by researchers, patients, healthcare professionals, health decision makers. It is important to part these questions and measure the outcomes that matter to patients. In the end, the research is to aim to improve the healthcare system and practices. Next slide, please. Very brief overview, and much of this can, will be discussed during workshops and training coming up, so I welcome you to take note and express your interest in your interest. How is patient-oriented research def demonstrated? These are just some definitions. Criteria are coming from the Canadian Institute for of Health Research. Engage patients and part as partners. It is focused, as I mentioned, on patient identified priorities. It is to improve patient uh, outcomes that are important to them. And it's really important to consider are you measuring these outcomes that matter patients throughout the entire research cycle? Also, multidisciplinary teams in partnerships with relevant stakeholders, and it aims to apply the knowledge generated or that we're mobilizing to improve healthcare system and practices. The simple uh, picture is to identify only briefly, and it still is linear, but I want to show the interactive mechanisms that take place between patients and researchers in the healthcare providers, professionals, and health decision making, where this empty space that you see in the middle, patient research partner, is not an empty space per se, but really is about the interaction.
collaboration between the different parties where we are setting priorities together, where we develop the research agenda together, extra research design, conduct research, and in the end, disseminate, implement, and evaluate as well. So this is only to show very briefly the dynamics that are very interesting, also complex for the different parties to navigate through. Next slide, please. So I just want to mention this slide again from the CIHR, what we mean by meaningful and active collaboration. We talk about that in, in terms of governance, priority setting, and conducting research, and knowledge translation. Now, I just, I just create this a little bit. What there's much focus when you see the drawing, there's much focus if I am conducting research and there is more attention given, for example, knowledge translation. But this whole piece of governance and priority setting is considered important. We want to talk about meaningful and active collaboration in the research process. So a thought on that is, is that the objectification of spirits happens. So we are starting to measure it and so that we're really speaking to the cognitive sense. We're starting to measure it. We're talking about um, GRIP2 from the United Kingdom is an evaluation measurement tool, the PPET, which is coming from McMaster University. However, I would encourage to everyone to encompass the theme of the sensory and the aesthetics in shared efforts in research over time. And I will speak to it. I would love to speak more about that in the future. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, what I can say, realizing I'm taking up a little bit more time um, and research, found is that patients in past and present, they are, there's still a place that patients have to follow research plans, yet perceive little influence, cooperation, and loyalty. They find research is not implemented. Patient involvement in health research is not a new idea, but investments, requirements, and incentives for doing this are new by patients at the strength of patient-oriented research. I wanted to bring forth that patients in the lower mainland agree on the intention of the provincial patient engagement strategy, but the elected strategies that are expected to implement in the interior region do not necessarily the needs of people in the interior region. So the thing we have in front of us is how is this new way of involving patients actually working within quality improvement and research practices? This is still unclear. And I'm very excited to share that IH agree to doing in-depth and detailed study to answer that question, which we named in the Scan Patient Engagement Initiative Study. In order to improve patient engagement and research practice, the researchers, healthcare professionals, and the makers have to adopt reflective practice and choices they make in the research process. Next, please. This is my last slide. It's just a very quick overview of some resources, and there's also contact information. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Karen. Uh, that was a, a very old presentation. We appreciate it. Any questions in the room or online? I know we have lots of people joining us online as well. We could do questions in the end. That'd be great. Oh, okay, fantastic. No problem. I'll just uh, pause the presentation up and running. Nope. Oh, Great. Okay. So, yes. Yes, please. Oh, I'm uh, Paul Bergener. Uh, um, background: I'm not in the healthcare side of things. I've come out of uh, industrial research and uh, commercialization of things. I'm a professional engineer, uh, sort of engineering physics in a strange way. And, uh, and a certified management consultant uh, these days on commercial technologies. Um, I was recruited by the uh, Patient Voices Network to be, you know, one of the voices that they could stick on focus groups from periodically and a very easy uh, approach to life. 
And uh, the uh, and it has it has grown to spending a lot more time rather than just being occasional uh, phone call. But um, yeah. No, I, I, by Karen to do, and I've been working with Karen now for almost two years, um, is some of the the view that I've seen as sort of the chin voice, again, this not not basically being operated on in a, in a research project or, or as a patient in the hospital, but voice. And uh, uh, so it's a broad aspect of what, what happens in the community. <coughs> as a patient, we're all patients from time to time uh, in, in the medical sense. Uh, we also have our views as to how things should work. Um, I think that uh, a patient voice improves our research effectiveness. Um, but again, my commercial side of things, uh, I did backgrounds just provide different views. People ask different questions. Uh, we have our own personal networks to sort of be six feet away from somewhere. Uh, if they participate in LinkedIn, you can see the great connections that uh, end up with uh, uh, very few people that you know, and then they know somebody else. Uh, so uh, from the research side of that, that, one may have the background of the researcher, and typically you don't, but you do have connections that you hear about, uh, and it just has more eyes and thoughts on, on what the researcher is actually trying to seek out and connect with. Um, so, with patients, uh, is expanding our healthcare in, in the sense that even we're doing at the moment, uh, we're using a communication technology um, that, again, is not new. Uh, I often complain it's actually a rather ancient one using WebEx, but it's. Uh, um, but as as we move out into the interior side that I'm familiar with, uh, we run into things that. WebEx is working very nicely to me uh, in Kelowna today. Uh, it may not be working very nicely in Williams Lake. Uh, our bandwidth is not the same. The, uh, the power supplies change up and down. The computer uh, literacy, if you want, at times by people that are separate from a center, uh, they have to do everything, which means there's something that is always a little little access to how to understand things and the time to get it together. Um, we're going to uh, look at your patients that are scattered about in our mostly empty uh, province. Uh, we have to learn better communication technologies. And in the healthcare, this also uh, deals with some of the uh, dealing with patients at distance. Um, so it's a problem. And, and so just having Patient voices that are being brought in to talk. Uh, we have to have uh, uh, better communication technologies, and that will also enhance our abilities to deliver healthcare. Too. Um, we uh, I, I, and under under uh, uh, how would I class it? Underutilized uh, aspect of the patient voices when one is looking at uh, doing research. Uh, is to put in volunteer hours. So from the budget side of things, you are not necessarily having to uh, find more dollars to have somebody provide some assistance to look at something, have to gather some information. Um, we have seen on some of the committees I'm involved with, different researchers saying, I would like a group of people to review the following things. I've got these questions to help formula either their proposal or actually their actual work that they're dealing with. And through Voices Networks and the various other uh, committees that are coming out of the score, um, we've been able to tap into this sort of expertise. So it reads some of the time constraints on the researchers to do what they are really excellent at. And by some of the more money or simpler aspects uh, in a, a non-financial consequence to the researcher. And uh, that is something that is starting to be seen, um, but I've certainly seen it from the reactions that I've uh, been involved with. Next slide, please. Uh, patients bringing new resources. Uh, 
as a, uh, again, not, not one being researched upon, but uh, as a voice. It's, um, we're in the, the research system. So we ask different questions, uh, such as, gee, this seems really nice. Uh, why can't we run a small trial? And of course, everybody realizes there's ethics and there's protocols and there's uh, uh, per, uh, scientific procedures and all the rest of it. And, and the overriding one is we don't want to hurt anybody. Uh, but asking some of those questions in an uneducated way as to what the system is doing um, does change the system that well, maybe there is this or that that uh, we have to do, and it, it, it can it can choose our approach to things. You know, example being my my background in industrial <coughs> cost accounting. Uh, that, that a lot of providing healthcare problems, which especially in the interior, is because of just it's a problem, not a healthcare problem. We have lots of healthcare people that provide all sorts of services, but provided to a community that has 400 people. Um, and we find it by saying, well, get on a bus, which of course is being canceled in October, um, and, uh, or hitchhike, or, or, or find a friend, or drive your vehicle. And you say, I'm not really feeling well. And you say, well, that's too bad. We have a, a central facility. It's only four and a half hours away from it. And if you pay for it yourself, and, and as again, there's mechanisms to get money back if you follow the paperwork in advance. But if you up at the hospital on your own accord, it's your own expense. Um, so those are sort of things that uh, uh, Karen has mentioned, that things that work in uh, a major center don't necessarily work when we get into uh, the more scattered, smaller communities uh, across the interior. Uh, looking at it as a healthcare problem means that, you know, how do we find people, how do we get this, as opposed to looking at it as a budget point of view of, of well, problem at all and providing service to uh, Williams. Like, uh, we just put a specialist on an airplane and he's there in two hours and he looks after it. That is a healthcare problem. That's really a budget problem. Um, and, and I realize that there's a limit of dollars, but it doesn't mean we could ask questions differently. And, and in, in time that we are asking that, how do we deal with uh, remote uh, interactions through some of the digital technologies? Uh, assuming you have a good width that you can digitally interact with these people, but they'll be solved, and we can ask different questions. Again, patients are involved in a lot of different forums and committees, if, uh, as I've found out myself, but I'm now presently on uh, patient-centered uh, uh, committee uh, uh, practices uh, and some other research side of things. I'm dealing with things that are uh, simplistic from a, from a research point of view, but I hear things. And, uh, uh, you know, I notice uh, on the topics of the day, there's somebody going to be talking about uh, uh, wound healing. Um, so, if they that, I, I do know some people that are having problems with uh, with wounds. Um, I would like that back to somebody who has the technical capability to do something about that. So, we bring a, a broader awareness uh, just because we're involved in more for siblings, but perhaps a, a wider breadth of it that we're able to bring back to the researcher and say, well, have you run across this or that? Whether it's meaningful, that's the researcher's expertise. Next slide. Um, and do this because I've seen that patients bring results in projects. Um, so one vein typically, but uh, I have certainly seen that from an administrative point of view, uh, interior health and the uh, uh, for type of programs, there's very good feedback to the patients as we've been involved in different things, that there's a commitment that we have a report back as to what difference made or, or how it was received, and then faithfully followed along. Uh, was uh, was in a, a new uh, pilot sort of program on uh, mental health and addiction, um, and it can pass us as, uh, as a group of people what do you think about this is nice and all the rest of it. And it was quite well, unfortunately, and it's, it's fortunately, mental health has got stigmas when you are uh, in the general public. 
of, uh, you know, well, crazy. And, and uh, you know, that is totally wrong, but it's a public perception. And so the name got changed to a wellness center. Um, so what does it mean? Well, then, then you have a chance to have a dialogue and discuss what it means instead of somebody looking at it as a generic name with, with a potential stigma because of lack of information. As part of that center, they have some nice posters to say, you know, this new center is there. It looked like uh, somebody went on the internet and put something out of a U.S. Uh, set of pictures because it tended to have, uh, uh, you know, an Afro-American and a Hispanic and uh, uh, a very white sort of person and all the rest of it, but for a community which uh, has a very strong indigenous community and did not reflect at all the, the the view walked around in Kamloops, and uh, um, so they, they looked at that and said, do you think it matters? And we said, well, yes, you're, you're trying to go and talk about a new way of introducing things to a community, and you've got people that don't belong in that community at all from the pictures. So they approached uh, different uh, agencies that were there that they worked with, and they had volunteers come forth and say, you can use my image and I will talk to what you're trying to do here because I appreciate what's happening in the community. So it makes it local and personalized as opposed to, well, here's something that doesn't really matter to us. Um, we proposals, um, there are things that have come through, certainly the patient engagement and research. Um, where different researchers had uh, provided uh, they were looking, trying to get some fun with the side of stuff. We were saying, yes, it's a patient focus. And at the end of the project, you said, and we will be interacting with patients. Um, well, that not really seem patient-centric. Uh, uh, and, and we poked at that. And unfortunately, as part of our peer review, uh, uh, that we realized some of the academic requirements that also went along with making the research and I'm adding in a very strong proposal for uh, action with, with patients and how it would benefit, uh, again, in the interior context. We bid on some of the uh, academic requirements so we're as a committee, and, and that will be shared then into the future. You know, of we will not make that mistake, and uh, uh, we'll be more balanced in, in uh, just provided back to researchers looking at how they meet this criteria and still get their academic requirements uh, also fulfilled. Um, we, we had been asked on an interior health uh, reach survey about various things, and we came back and said, well, you've forgotten the following aspect. And, uh, and that added in, and it ended up on their annual report of saying, originally we looked at three aspects, we added a fourth one. And uh, um, again, there, there was positive feedback. If you looked at uh, Karen's slides, uh, there was only two unspecified uh, 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 PER and PUR, which uh, I suspect health-wise is evident as uh, patients engaged in research and patient-oriented research. Uh, but the strong patient pushback, if you want to deal with patients, talk English, don't talk some special jargon, there's a uh, actual a whole book put out of different wording as to, yes, it looks like this word, but it means something else to the healthcare people. Uh, I think this is a general problem with any specialized group. It doesn't have to apply to uh, healthcare. can apply to anybody else. So, uh, and, you know, various other things that we can look at. Uh, we've used... Uh, um, you know, I think what we're saying here is there is a lot of different cases that even in the last year we've seen uh, involvement with patients, and uh, uh, they, they've they've results coming back, and that's made it worthwhile going forward that we're able to to talk and be valued. Uh, it, it provides uh, a context, and it just improves our overall health care. Next slide. There we are. It's uh, important to have patients involved, both for the patient and the researchers. 
we get to share experience. Um, research in human beings is a full contact uh, uh, metal side of things and placebo effects and all the rest do affect uh, your results. So it's not just a, a pure scientific structure. That there's this human contact and we need to be involved with the people in that context. Um, and a lot of research funding, I think, is driven by public uh, advocation. Uh, uh, if the public really wants it, uh, it's probably bad to go against your with the uh, people that vote you into the service. So the more the public understands research is really needed, the more education we get uh, in moving it forward. And uh, and we've seen the healthcare administration values the feedback and, and continues to stay in touch. So thank you much. Last slide. It's contact side of things. Uh, uh, Karen is the principal person, but if someone wants to bounce something off me, I'm available. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paul. Hello again, Lauren. Hello. 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 So, um, welcome everyone. Thank you for taking the time to be here or tune in online today. Uh, my name is Lauren Harris and I'm a Master of Science in Nursing student at UBCO, as well as an RN specialized in mental health. So, I'd like to take, uh, share a bit about my research for my thesis and how, as a research team, we can a patient-oriented approach. So my thesis is on the experiences of rural older adults with mental health concerns, specifically in Princeton. I'm real now. I sent the copy of slides that doesn't have the link for where this picture came from. So I did not take this picture. I'll send that for the recording. Hopefully. But um, I chose to start the presentation with this picture because it is a bridge in Princeton, and to me it represents um, the gap that we're trying to bridge between care providers' assumptions and patients' experiences in research. And besides myself, uh, we have a research team consisting of uh, Nellie Olke with the School of Nursing at UBCO and Carolyn Sostak uh, with the Department of Psychology at UBCO. We have Karen Fulton, who's a registered nurse specialized in mental health in Princeton. Karen Evans, who's the print of the South Okanagan and Smokey Mental Wellness Society. And Nola Mench, who is our patient population representative and an integral part of the work that we're doing in Princeton. Than right now. We've also received uh, from the CNS, the SOS Research Foundation, UBC, and MyPAC. So the study aims to understand participant experiences, uh, to empower the participants, and to provide evidence for practice decisions in rural areas with older adults who have mental health concerns. Using critical social theory has meant focusing on inherent power imbalances, which Nola has helped us identify, uh, related to those with and without mental illness in Princeton. This will also mean taking action on our findings. And her description defines reality as complex and subjective, and in the case of this study, we are aiming to address the gap in care for the population in rural areas. Uh, please make sure to mute your line. We're getting some background noise on the video. So we've chosen photo voice as our data collection method, uh, which I'll elaborate on in our next slide here. And finally, uh, we are using constant comparison to analyze the data. We're still getting that background noise to who is on the line. Please make sure to mute your line. You can press. The voice was developed by Wang and Burris in 1997 to empower women who were living in rural China. And we chose this data collection method to ensure that participants could clearly articulate their experiences through photos, interviews, and captions that they provide. We discussed this decision with the research team, and NOLA particularly agreed it would be a beneficial way for people to share their stories. And again, it aligns with our philosophical opinions and the methodology as well. The so photo voice process encompasses a number of steps. Um, actually, we held an educational session on the ethics of photography, examples of how to document mental health experiences, and how the cameras provided. Yes, and we gave time for participants to ask questions and offer feedback on how things were going to look over the next couple of weeks. 
after two weeks of participants taking photos, I held individual interviews and reviewed photos that participants selected as the most significant and used the code method to elicit responses which would target our objectives. Again, the method of interviewing was discussed with our population representatives. Matching will occur once all participants have been interviewed and we have themes to share with the group. Uh, signs will be discussed with the participants to see if this is an accurate reflection of their experience and not just the assumptions of us as researchers. Knowledge translation will occur in partnership with participants. They will determine how they would like to share the findings with their community, which could be a gallery night, photo books placed through a community, or the use of a website. We also explain that since this is part of my thesis, findings will be published in relation to my studies. As you can see, uh, we've taken a few steps to ensure the participant population is in control and part of the process and the findings that will be shared as part of this study. Um, NOLA was approached and agreed to take on the role as patient partner on the research team as she has participated in previous research studies and is involved in advocacy work around Princeton regarding mental health. She's a team member on the research team, which includes researchers and care providers, as you heard. She will speak to the culture in Princeton around mental health, include how to recruit, how people would become, or where people would be comfortable meeting, um, how she thought meetings could be conducted in a way which would make the participants comfortable, and gave input on each step of the research process as it was discussed prior to data collection. So that our research stayed true to its design, addressing critical social theory by ensuring not only the data speaks to the participant experience, but that methods align with what is needed in the community and what participants would feel comfortable engaging with. Additionally, this means we're using an integrated KT approach by having a participant with lived experience as part of our team. Her contributions have been invaluable for our project so far. Parties have also provided informed consent throughout the research process for sharing their photos, being recorded, how they wish to be acknowledged for their contributions, and which photos they're comfortable using. Checking occurs, the participants will also have part of the final say in what our true findings are. So far, our participants have opened up about areas of their life they haven't shared with many people and feel are an important part of their life as someone with a mental health concern in Princeton. Recruitment has occurred in partnership with Karen Fulton, Sharon Evans, and a member of the Princeton Mental Health Clubhouse. As predicted by NOLA, we've had some difficulty recruiting people as they're afraid of being associated with having a mental health concern in a small community. Um, we were able to talk to NOLA about what recruitment process she felt was best to work through that. And some themes from interviews have been identified so far. These are very preliminary as we've only um, gone through about four interviews so far and Carolyn and Nellie will also be reading over the transcript. Additionally, uh, the research team members, including NOAA, will be involved in discussions around our themes that are identified. Next slide. So, thank you for taking the time to hear about this research and the importance of having patient population representatives involved throughout the research process. I know for us it has been like an invaluable having NOLA as part of our decision-making process out, and I'm really looking forward to member checking and knowledge translation activities that we have coming up. Okay. Well, if you can unmute your I'll get your presentation up. Okay. Great. Can you can you hear me? Great. Good. Right. Thank you for. Oh, sorry. Don't worry, Kathy. Great. So, thank you for the opportunity to be able to share a little bit about um, how we have uh, engaged. A representative in our research, um, and I'm just going to um, have you go to the next slide. So I just want to give you a little bit of context for patient engagement. And so this particular funded project uh, relates to urinary incontinence, and as you uh, would be aware, uh, most likely it affects a significant proportion of our population. So 3.5 million Canadians um, are affected by urinary incontinence and certainly the highest prevalence is in older adult men and women. And so older adults often suffer in silence with urinary in, uh, incontinence and often 
about 50% really never seek um, help for help for their symptoms. So left undetected and untreated, um, it is a, a condition that certainly can uh, probably get worse, and it makes management that much more difficult. And so uh, early detection and referral are really critical. So we um, in looking at ways that we might be able to address this particular situation. So we came up with the idea of self screening um, as one approach that could perhaps facilitate older adults in terms of health seeking related to this particular um, health issue. And so using a randomized controlled trial, we're comparing a self screening process to usual care to determine whether uh, the intervention uh, impacts health seeking, uh, quality of life, and then just symptom management. So the next slide. Um, introduces our team. I haven't sort of given specific names to the team members, but uh, we do have uh, clinical nurse specialists uh, in gerontology, uh, an epidemiologist, a geriatrician who specializes in urinary incontinence. We've got some trainees and we have a patient with urinary incontinence. Okay. Our patient engagement. So with this particular um, this particular um, health challenge, uh, we thought it was really very important to have someone with urinary incontinence just to help us navigate some of the issues um, we anticipated uh, around, and these have been mentioned um, in previous presentations around recruitment, uh, just some data, uh, data collection, and just even knowledge translation. So um, we certainly wanted to um, involve a team member, uh, a, a patient representative. Uh, we also, as has been mentioned, want to maximize the usefulness and relevance of this research and the outcomes for our user group, um, and then to promote the success of the project. Uh, it was important also just from knowledge translation and uptake perspective to involve someone, and it also a requirement of the funder. Um, so, and the specific worry uh, in the call for, for um, proposals was the project needs to be developed with and for older adults. Next, patient representative. So our patient representative uh, with uh, someone who has urinary incontinence uh, is a female uh, who is a young older adult so in her late 60s, um, is married, uh, is active. Um, so you can see here that she engages in lots of different activities uh, from uh, taking language, language classes to whitewater rafting. Uh, she's very well educated. She is a retired teacher with a master's in education as her highest degree and, she, and highly motivated. And so she calls herself a lifelong learner. And so I just I put this up here mainly because, of course, um, you know, one of, the, one of the challenges is inviting a, a patient representative who really represents the patient population. And we are very aware that our patient representative, um, who is, has been invaluable to the team, does not entirely represent um, the, the population of those with urinary incontinence. Um, and for example, we don't have a man on our team at the moment, um, but certainly it is, this problem is a, an issue for men as well. And certainly having, uh, you know, another patient representative uh, to represent that side of things would, would be beneficial as well. So we are aware that we are bringing uh, a certain voice to the table that was mentioned in Paul's, Paul's um, presentation. Uh, next slide, please. How have we engaged our, our patient representative? So our, our patient has been involved in all activities related to the project and certainly has volunteered far more than we anticipated. Um, she has been very enthusiastic uh, and um, we have really appreciated her contributions. And so she has been really involved since the inception of the, of the, um, the project. So with the idea, she liked the idea um, to be able to do some self-screening and to look at impacts um, on especially help seeking. Um, so she was involved certainly in even in submitting a CV. So the funder required that all the team members needed to put together like a two-page CV for purposes of the submission. And so she quickly put hers together, review, you know, updated it, and it was submitted as part of the package. And she certainly was part of even like reviewing the materials. She perhaps didn't um, review them as extensively as the rest of the team did, but she was certainly a, a part of being able to um, feedback on certainly the ideas and just what we were doing. Um, she has been involved in the ethics piece of it as well. Um, she was very keen to be able to uh, complete the TCPS2. Um, and so, you know, for, any, for all of you or any of you who have done those, they are time consuming. Uh, she was so um, 
enthusiastic to complete them. She probably had them done before other team members who also had to complete them um, as a requirement uh, for, for ethics approval. Uh, so she is a named team member on our ethics certificate. She has been certainly actively involved in just uh, reviewing recruitment materials as well, particularly with the sensitive nature of urinary incontinence. It was really important to have someone who could take a look at the language that we were using and to ensuring um, we were um, using language that would encourage people to participate um, and to feel more comfortable um, or to the extent possible uh, comfortable in participating in the project and so that was extremely valuable. Someone else looking at it might have some different input, but um, certainly our, our patient uh, rep has been really helpful. Uh, also, uh, in terms of just recruitment venues, has been really helpful in, in identifying ones that we would not have necessarily thought about. And again, Paul um, sort of certainly alluded to that in, just term, in terms of the networks and uh, the connections that um, our reps have. They can, you know, they can certainly. Um, the lines out there in ways that we can't necessarily do so. Uh, she's also been really helpful in terms of even identifying incentives. So, um, for example, you know, typically we might go with coffee gift certificates uh, to give to participants for the, for the patient and, um, you know, wanting to sort of know whether that would be appropriate for this particular population. And indeed, she sort of has, has redirected us in terms of the more appropriate kinds of incentives that we would want to use. Um, we also um, will be doing, we haven't gotten to this stage, we are still in the process of recruiting and we continue to have challenges with that, uh, just like Lauren was alluding <laughs> To and hers as well, um, and so we continue to recruit, um, but we will be, and we have been doing some KT, um, so we've been doing lots of going out into the community to talk about the project um, and getting feedback even that way uh, in terms of learning to, to um, assist us, uh, but she will be certainly involved in uh, like a, the Cafe Scientific Geek that eventually will hold and other uh, KT activities as well. Um, slide, please really end with just some reflections on having a patient rep on the team. So certainly there have been benefits to the team and benefits to her, I think. Um, so certainly we certainly regard her as a full-fledged team member. She really is one of us and she makes contributions that are different but complementary um, and equally as valuable as other team members. And I wanted to pick up on something that Paul mentioned just in terms of um, she has not been really intimidated with the whole research process and in fact I think perhaps some of her background um, having completed a master's and so on um, she has been relatively comfortable with kind of that whole research process and has asked questions I think that um, that have been very helpful uh, to us so um, it's been you know it's been one I would perceive that hasn't had a whole lot of power differentials at least I would perceive it in that regard um, that we are certainly equal um, team members in this whole venture and as has been alluded to often so of that insider experiential perspective that um, that we we cannot bring to the table, um, and again contributing networks that have been valuable valuable for recruitment and will be for KT um, efforts as well. And then just benefits to our patient. Um, certainly learning new things has been important to her. She regards herself as a lifelong learner. And a comment she made was, "I think my brain just woke up just uh, from a few years of inactivity." So she's been really excited to be able to be engaged in this uh, in this way, um, contributing to a project with potential to make a difference in life with people with urinary incontinence and just feeling valued for the expertise and insight that she brings. Slide are just um, you know acknowledgments to our team, to the folks who are supporting through the University of British Columbia, Interior Health, and to our funder, the retired teachers of Ontario. Slide five. Slide five. Any questions for any of the presenters, either on the line or in the room? I have a question. I just want to go ahead carry over the um, mic here in the room. I'm with the Interior Health Research Department. So um, thank you to all four of the presenters. Wonderful presentations, and they certainly gave us a very good um, Mix of views on how patients can truly engage in research and be part of research teams. And I think um, we can all certainly appreciate and anticipate the benefits and payoffs that health research will have the more and more that we engage and involve patient partners in the process. Apart from the two researchers, and I, I think Karen and Paul would certainly agree with me, one of the challenges in health research that involves human participants is always recruitment. 
it seems to um, it doesn't really seem to matter often what the topic of the actual research project is. Um, we do a lot of facilitation in our research department, and often recruitment is the piece where a research project, despite all of the good intentions and hard work and funding behind it, will often get stalled or delayed or kind of fall short. And I was listening to the four presentations. I think this is an area where maybe patient partners can really, really help us. And I think they probably have a lot of potential in helping us to recruit in ways that we probably haven't even anticipated as researchers before. Like, it's often we're really not still connecting with the people that we really want to do the research with. And I just wanted, to, if wonder with a few reflections from the presenters on how can we have patient partners help us with that recruitment process? And if there are other potential and maybe other avenues for recruitment that they might bring to that we just traditionally haven't used. We did the healthcare portals in Nelson. Um, starting then, I was a patient voice and have been on just some of these things, and I happen to be on that one. Um, and there was a center to sign up out of the hospital because, obviously from a budget point of view, you don't have to pay anything. Seems to Vancouver or even here in. Uh, 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 quite a, an easy, accessible situation. The hospital was a unique place for Nelson. The hospital Nelson happens to be from downtown. There's about yeah. 100 steps vertically to get to the hospital uh, downtown, or you can take the bus, which takes about an hour from wherever you are. Um, and then you did your five-minute sign-up and then had to wait for a bus to come in. So you end up with about two and a half hours to do five The treat nurse was assigned with the task of signing people up, so you had to do, had to do her obvious Unlikely. care side of things as well as stand there and add more duties to her. They sent somebody out to sign people up uh, who was there between sort of 9, 3 o'clock, and of course the great population was working during those hours. Mm -hmm. um, so it was an out-of-touch approach. If they'd approached me as a patient voice, I would have on the local uh, uh, radio thing, and I would have talked to Shaw on their presentation. Uh, that weekend, there was a, a public gathering for celebrating in Nelson, where there was about a thousand members of families with children and grandparents and all the rest of us, and it stuck a booth up. Uh, I heard committees and mm -hmm. people in that town who would have together to try and improve our access to health records, uh, but it was not consulted to us, it was kind of posed upon us. So I think, again, it's the aspect of the, the patient is not someone who's a token, they are actually a, a real positive uh, resource, and as they're pushing back, we need the following things, we aren't sure how to do it, you start all these other aspects such as, you know, community networks and media presentations and so on, uh, that's outside of the, the normal responsibilities of, of someone trying to do research, and, uh, uh, and they, they should be expected to learn all of that. We need researchers that are specialized in doing research. The patient voice side of it brings in those other sorts of ways of doing it. And, uh, Thank you. Great example. For us, we started to find more success with recruitment from um, even just in the last week. Recognizing part of it was seasonal in that we started our recruitment in summer and no town in summer or they have other things going on or that kind of thing. And, and speaking with our population representative on the team, um, as other people who are part of the research, they kind of talked to their friends and said, hey, I'm a part of this, and if you're interested, like, you can call this number, that kind of thing. So in the last week, we've seen more of that where I'm speaking with people who are saying, like, hey, my friend's part of this study. They told me about their experience, so now I'm interested in it. And sort of word of mouth just between people has become more of a, a topping, too. It's kind of 
Tara, and if I might jump in from Nelson, I think it's a very good question. Recruitment is a challenge. It's not just interior. It's national. It's yeah. international. It's cross Canada. Um, and I think um, the bit of working with a patient partner right from the start can already help tackle that. But the other thing which I often heard, living role and having a role for about 26 years now, is that there are many opportunities that are offered in the urban centers, and it can be very frustrating, is the word that I heard, and so I will re we'll reuse it, where people uh, want to contribute to research, but the opportunity is still offered from an urban lens, and that is from not only UBC Vancouver, for example, as a main university in the lower mainland, um, but as well uh, in, in the Okanagan, where is still that, that getting together and coming together, which is wonderful if possible. I know the peer committee would like to come together face-to-face, -to -face, but if we're talking in such a geographic center, it is in need, and Paul is putting, is putting his finger on it every time, is where the technological infrastructure is an opportunity to help with recruitment. And so it's coming perhaps with the recruitment not only from a clinical lens where people need to be part of blood work or, um, or, or, or what, genetic testing, whatever research they're doing, but contributing to the research as, as well can be done online and can be done virtual. And there is, as we can develop into a learning healthcare system, there is definitely an opportunity, I think, to, to put more attention to that. I might be room for one more question, but I, before we run off and finish this wonderful session, and thank you all very much, I just would like to mention, and Kim is so kindly pulled this up, that the BC Support Unit webpage, it is continuously updated on tons of information, and I must say, and sometimes tiny overwhelming, but you can use the search button on the top, and I found it to be quite friendly so far. Um, but there is an opportunity coming up for grant funding, and the application uh, uh, for submission opened up just last week. The information can be found if you enter the BC Support Unit P2P Awards. The uh, webinar was held on September 14th. It was, I believe, about half an hour, 40 minutes. In more detail about the criteria uh, for pipe feasibility study. And then I must say, and I'm, this can be, uh, I can share this because it has been noted that the criteria are quite narrow. Um, however, there is an opportunity for patients and researchers and healthcare providers, clinicians, to collaborate on the, on the design of a research proposal and the deadline for submission is October 31st. If you have questions, please reach out. And, uh, there's tons of resources through the IH Research Department to help you develop the proposal if you wish. For the research study, we have people who have um, uh, hold knowledge on a data analysis, who hold knowledge on knowledge translation, who hold knowledge on indigenous engagement, hold knowledge in patient engagement, ethics and all sorts of things. So I would really welcome uh, for use the opportunity to speak about the resources that we offer through Interior Health and part of the BC Support Unit. And open for one more question. We do one more question for Paul, actually, um, and we have a minute. <laughs> uh, the question is that you mentioned patient four, and can you recommend some that are active in the interior that perhaps you're involved with, or perhaps you're involved with? I think for uh, uh, it's, uh, engagement on things, the Invoice of Network, you should look onto their website. Uh, they post things every month. Uh, it gives you a wide spectrum of things. That's how I got involved with this. And I sort of evolved along and I was doing something useful and I started watching what they were looking for and found a research fit with some background and uh, involved with the uh, peer program. Uh, I think Payboys Network is the really best way. It, it's very effective uh, and, and to, to get involved with Great. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you to Kathy, Karen, Lauren, and Paul for being our presenters. Thank you everyone for registering for each week and everybody that's available to attend in person. And uh, as we have recorded this session, we'll be posting it online later in the week. Thank you so much. Have a
Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.